Now, let's follow the films. Uh, there is another film by Stanley Kramer, 1961, uh, Judgment of Nuremberg. Uh, I remember I've seen that film when I was in high school, and it was my first encounter with Nuremberg. And I thought it was a good film. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it was a, a study of a, a German uh, jurist who collaborated with Hitler's regime. Uh, uh, now, uh, Hanike Klusen uh, is going to talk about Nazi perpetrators on trial, the challenge of exhibiting uh, intangible contents. Henrike Klausen is a historian and director of Memorium Nuremberg Trials. Uh, she studied modern history, history of art and archaeology at Cologne University. Uh, she received MA uh, from that institution, and uh, she served as a research associate at Documentation Center Nazi Party Rally Grounds in Nuremberg and the White Rose Foundation in me before taking on the role of the project coordinator and curator for the setting up Memorium Nuremberg Trials in 2007. Uh, okay, uh, floor is yours, 20 minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I totally agree on that um, Stanley Kramer's film is an amazing film. Uh, but I don't recommend it to watch it as a historical documentary because it mixes up a lot of aspects from several trials on Nuremberg. So sometimes people get a little bit confused about the historical truth so, or the historical facts from Nuremberg. But I totally agree. It's an amazing, it's an amazing piece of art, film art. Um, actually, I am talking about, um, today I will be talking about rather, I mean, a site very much associated with Nazi perpetrators, but um, in fact not being a perpetrator site. Um, so, um, before I come to our ex actual institution, I would very much like to start with a very brief outline of uh, the situation in Nuremberg. Um, so this is the city of Nuremberg, um, a photograph I, I borrowed from Google Maps. Um, and I just want to outline that um, I'm trying to do that while I'm speaking. Um, now I have the same problem. Okay, so um, this, what you see here, is the city center, the historic medieval city center of Nuremberg. And um, I will continue with more information about it just to show it to you. All this area here, this huge area here is what used to be the Nazi party rally grounds in Nuremberg, uh, which used to be a site of about 11 square kilometers in the 1930s. Um, today there remains on the area of about four square, uh, four square kilometers. And this is where the red dot is. This is where the Nuremberg courthouse is. Um, so the, where the Memoriam Nuremberg trials is located. Um, in my presentation, I will not speak a lot about our actual um, exhibition, but instead will rather say something about the different expectations and perspectives on the Nuremberg trials and um, their venue. Oh, wrong way. So, just again, briefly, I, I think I will have to skip some of these things. This is just, again, to show you the dimensions of the Nazi party rally grounds, and I'm so much focusing on it because a lot of people mix it up. Uh, we quite often um, have the reaction that we have visitors um, coming, or I'm, I quite often meet people all over the world and saying, well, yeah, I have been to your place. And then it turns out they have been, in fact, to the documentation center. And the same happens the other way around. Um, so what you see on this photograph on the left is it's a black and white photograph. And you see these brownish parts. So all these brownish parts are parts that had been there during um, had been already built in the 1930s or maybe um, or had been taken away afterwards or were never completed. But um, So you get an idea of really of the size of it. Um, and also to give you an idea of what it, um, what it 
what the what the historic site in Nuremberg during the Nazi regime meant. This is a photograph showing the Zeppelin field, um, the Zeppelin Tribune as one of the most iconic um, remains and also one of the most iconic um, buildings on the on the rally grounds. Uh, most of you might know it from Leni Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will. <laughs> this is probably the film that really made the Nazi, pro the, the, um, Nazi party rallies really famous. And so the photograph on the left shows you um, the actual situation during the Nazi party rallies, and what you see on the right is the remains of the of the um, of the tr of the tribune of the grandstand. And just to 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 get your your coordinates on the picture right. Um, oh, again. So this, ne, uh, so this part over here is basically this end. So all these colonnades, they're gone. So you would have to imagine on the photo on the right side hand side, you would need to imagine these huge colonnades on, on, on each side. So, um, so Nuremberg, that's why I'm, why I'm pointing out on this, is a place that is strongly connected with, um, with Nazi history and was, um, was um, one of the most iconic uh, places. It was one of the privileged Führer cities and became the city of the rallies. And um, after 1933, was the venue for the Nazis regime annual propaganda shows. And I mean, Jennifer already showed it in her ex in in her, in her presentation. And um, of course, Nuremberg also is very much linked just by the name of the city. Um, with the racial laws, the Nuremberg laws, so there is a very, very strong connection. And um, we have, since 2001, we have the Documentation Center Nazi Party Rally Grounds, which informs about um, this history um, in Nuremberg. The second place that is linked to this history is Courtroom 600 um, in the Palace of Justice, which was inaugurated in 1916 at the western end of the city and today still houses the local, regional and upper regional court of Nuremberg. So, I have to skip some things. <laughs> so this is a photograph of Palace of Justice. Again, on the left-hand side, this is from summer 1945. On the right-hand side, it's a photograph, or more recently, it's a, I think it's, it was taken 2005. Um, so in July 1945, the main allies of Second World War decided to make Nuremberg the venue for the first international trial of the leading representatives of the Nazi regime. And when we talk about the Nuremberg trials, we're actually talking about two different types of trials. So this again, referring to both to the Weizsäcker photograph you just saw and the film, uh, the Stanley Kramer film. Um, when we talk about the Nuremberg trials, we are basically talking about the Nuremberg trial, which is the most prominent one, the IMT, the International Military Tribunal. Um, that was held between the 20th of November 1945 and ended on the 1st of October 1946. And uh, that was a tribunal or a trial held before a tribunal set up by the United States, the Soviet Union, France and Great Britain. This trial was followed between, April, uh, between December 46 and April 49 by 12 subsequent trials held only before the U before US American military tribunals and the Weizsäcker trial the ministry's case is one of these um, of these trials by the one uh, the one that that ended only in April 49 so the establishment of the of the IMT the international military tribunal the first one set completely new standards in international law um, it was the first international criminal tribunal in world history and it was the first time that the members of a government were held accountable for the crimes they had been committed they had com that had been committed by their orders or in the name of their ideology so this is what the building looks like today again on the right hand side you see a photograph from uh, from the period of the International Military Tribunal. Since um, 2010, um, this 
Palace of Justice, or to be more precisely, this building on the on the right hand side, the former Jewry Court building, is also um, is still a courthouse, an active courthouse, but also is the home of the Memoriam Nuremberg trial. So we are located. So we are, this is our entrance, and we are located up here in the, in the attic, so in this area, and these four windows are the windows of uh, courtroom 600. So that's what basically everyone comes to see. Um, like the documentation center, the memoriam is part of the network of Nuremberg Municipal Museums. And um, we currently have about 100,000 visitors, a little bit more. Um, still, fortunately, annually rising visit number of visitors, about 10% each year. And a very specific aspect regarding our visitors is that between 75 to 80% of our visitors come from abroad. So if we would be really consequent, we would just have our ex exhibition in English and then offer for some German visitors um, a German audio guide or something like that. So this is or the memoriam definitely is a tourist, a touristic attraction in the region, and the core definitely is uh, courtroom 600. And I would like to briefly say a little bit about the about the history of this site, of this venue. So I already said it was opened in 1916, and um, what a lot of people tend to forget it is that it also already, ha I mean, there's a history between 1916 and 1945. A lot of people reduce um, the, the, how should I say that, the value or the, the, the content of the site only, only to, to the years 45 to 49. Um, but it had a very eventful history. It is, it, that's, for example, in 1925, um, this was a courtroom where Hitler um, testified for Julius Streicher. So he was, I mean, he, was, he never was a defendant in this courtroom, but he was there as a witness. Um, it is also the place where the special courts of the Nazis, the Nuremberg Special Court, um, held the most prominent cases they were having in Nuremberg. So it's also, in that sense, a site of perpetrators, if you want to say so. Um, and after the end of the Nuremberg trials, it also was the courtroom of CORA, so the Court of Restitutional Appeals for the American sector um, for several years. So it was not only in a light use, so to say, uh, during 40, uh, between 45 and 49, but also afterwards. And it was given back to Bavarian authorities in 1961. Um, it was, on this photograph, you see the courtroom today on the left-hand side. This is what it looks like today if a court is going on, or as court is in session. And on the right-hand side, you see courtroom 600 after the construction work that had taken place for, for the Nuremberg trials. So a lot of things changed there, or were changed. In 1961, uh, sorry, it was immediately reconstructed into what it looks like today. So all the, the, the construction work that, that had to take place to prepare it for the Nuremberg trials, which was a huge enlargement. They, for example, took out the complete back wall to enlarge the courtroom. All this was immediately replaced by the situation um, we have until today. So this is, as I said, so this is courtroom 600 today. As it still is in use by the court, we cannot install anything permanently. So everything has to be flexible and has to be taken out if there is a court, if the court is in session. Which means we have these, these very simple panels uh, in the courtroom just to explain, explain some places in the courtroom. And we have these iPad stations uh, which allow also to show film materials, etc. But it's, um, as I've said, it, we have to take it all out. Um, so during court sessions, there is no access to uh, no access for our visitors, which, as you can imagine, leads to a lot of disappointment. <laughs> we have to deal with, and. Um, 
another thing that is um, disappointing is that courtroom 600 doesn't look like it used to look in 1945. So the only authentic remains in courtroom 600 today are the wooden paneling on the wall. It, um, it's the marble doors and it's the ceiling and that's it. Everything else um, was changed. So just briefly, I don't want to talk about our, our exhibition, So, but this is just to have, at least to give you a clue of what our exhibition in the attic looks like. It's a very much a documentary style. We don't have, we don't, ha we hardly have any objects, just a very small limited number of, um, of objects. And in, at the moment, our exhibition is, um, has more or less three sections. The first section, which covers about 50% of the space, is about the IMT. We have another 25% about subsequent trials, including prosecution of Nazi crimes during the period of the Cold War. And then we have a third section, which is dealing with the legacy of Nuremberg, um, international criminal justice um, today. So, um, this is one of these very rare <laughs> pieces of objects we have in our exhibition on the right-hand side. This is two benches from, the, from originally four benches in the dock, and these are the ones that stood there. So, the two on the left-hand side, so it is um, Goering, uh, in the front line there, in, in, the, in the first row, and um, it starts with um, Dönitz on this, in the second row. Um, the photograph you see on the left, again, I think that was an important um, remark you made. It's a, it's a, a color photograph <laughs> that makes, and that's original, so that's nothing we just recolored. And this probably is one of the most iconic pictures. Um, I think all of you know it. Um, it's an iconic picture that symbolizes the end of the Nazi regime. And um, now I'm coming to my actual point. This is what our visitors want to see. <laughs> but um, that's what they expect to see. That's, what's, that's what is the image they have in mind when they come to our place. But they don't get to see it, um, simply because courtroom 600 was changed in so many ways. And as I said, the benches in the exhibition are two of the very rare physical remains of um, the courtroom of 1945. Um, it's not because we don't want to put these things on display, it's simply not there, it's simply gone. So we don't know where all these things have gone to. So, as I said, um, this leads to a lot of disappointment. But I consider these expectations or this disappointment also as an educational chance because they, this evolves questions. And um, so this gives us actually the opportunity <laughs> to, to jump in and start to explain. So why does courtroom 600 doesn't look like it used to look like in 1945? And why could it happen that such an important historic venue was changed? So people simply don't understand it. Um, so this is one of the points where we actually can start to explain the history, the very dif difficult history that there is not at, at, not, at, not at all a straight way of coming to terms with Nazi history in Germany from 1945 until today. And that also, for example, the reconstruction of Courtroom 600 is a, is a sign for the, the struggling with this past in the 1960s. So... Um, and talking about expectations, we also sometimes recognize the misleading expectations that our exhibition would reflect Nazi history, so including the crimes and um, atrocities committed by the Nazis. But in fact, it doesn't, because what we do is we do reflect how the Allies, and then later on German authorities, etc., dealt with these crimes. So what we do is we rather reflect the reflection. So regarding the, 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 the title of this panel, it's the question yeah, um, whether, I mean, do we deal with the perpetrators? Um, no, actually we deal with how others dealt with the perpetrators. So it's, it's basically, it's a little, it's even more complex. Um, which also leads me to the aspect that I consider the courtroom rather, well, 
<clears throat> to be consequent, I consider it rather a memory site for the Allies than, than, a, than a German site, because it is the question what is... Um, I mean, of course, it has to, has to do with German history, no doubt about it. Um, but as this photograph, this image that everyone has in mind, the defendants in the dark, is, um, I mean, this only represents a very small part of the whole thing, but that's what people have in mind. So they think of perpetrators when they come to our place, and then they basically are learning that... Um, this is, I mean, this is the full show, so to speak. So you only have, on the left-hand side, you see the perpetrators. This is a photograph from March 1946 during the cross-examination of Goering. So if you look closely, you, you see him there in the witness stand um, trying, to, trying to listen. And so you have the, the, um, the judges on the right-hand side. You, you see... Um, a council on the on the lectern speaking to the court, and you see Goering listening. You see in the left corner um, the interpreters, and in the front you see four tables for four prosecution teams. So there was a lot of lot going on um, at this place, and um, so. In the end, the defendants were, they were subject of the trial, but they weren't really like the active players, so to say so. So. For example, it could be the judges. I mean, they're playing an important role in a trial. So, but this isn't at all an iconic picture. So I don't know whether how many of you would be able to name any of the judges of the, of the International Military Tribunal. Same with, as I said, prosecution teams. So, so many people, hundreds of people work for the prosecution in Nuremberg in total. Um, four prosecution teams um, each each nation sending their own chief prosecutor, including a full team of investigators and um, secretaries and whatever. So really a lot of, um, a lot of people working there and um, trying to, to bring this to, to a successful end. And also, um, how about logistics? Um, with more than a thousand people working at the trials, and it simply wouldn't have been possible to to realize this trial. So, and the Nuremberg trial was a novelty in so many ways, and uh, without any doubt in legal terms. But also, as maybe not so many of you know, it was also the birthplace of something that all of us today and yesterday benefited benefited from during this conference, and that's simultaneous interpreting. <laughs> Um, before the IMT, there was only consecutive interpreting, and it was only for the reason that the trial needed to be conducted in four languages, that they tried out a new system, by the way, again, by IBM. And um, so it, um, in Nuremberg, it was the first time that there were sim simultaneous interpreters working, none of them professionals, simply before the before be, because they were the first ones. And this is, why the way, by the way, also the chance to thank the wonderful interpreters who've been doing a wonderful job today and yesterday. So, so since I've been working at the memoriam, I learned a lot about the t special task of interpreters, simultaneous interpreters. Probably they will say I'm, I'm too, too fast. Um, so... Just briefly to end, um, if I would have to say what do we actually memorialize at the memoriam, I, it's certainly not the perpetrators. Um, it is certainly the great achievement, the efforts and the achievement of the allies to, putting, to, to setting up this trial, um, which wasn't a matter of course at all at that time. But it is mainly um, to... To, um, to raise sensitivity for the value of the rule of law. I think that is something that Nuremberg really stands for. It is a place um, of the rule of law. I mean, there's a lot of discussion about a lot of details in Nuremberg and so on. But in general, um, I would definitely say it was a trial by the rule of law. And that is also... I definitely think the basis for the, until today, the very positive... Uh, perception of the trial, or I should rather say, again today, the very um, positive 
a perception of the trial. So I could tell, say a lot about the different national um, narratives we are facing with, but I think I should just stop here and maybe leave, it, leave that to questions. Thanks a lot. This was a very nice paper.